Welcome to the first lecture of this semester for courses TDT 4186 Operating Systems and also TDT 4205 Compile Construction. We'll start this semester with a quick introduction to C programming, especially for students who haven't programmed in C before but know a bit about programming in Java, for example, and also for students who have had a bit of introduction to C before and need a refresher or want to know some more details. We are going to program the practical exercises in both courses in C this semester, so this course shall help you to get started with this. So the idea of this course is to set a common knowledge base for all of you and to show important differences between, for example, Java and C programming and or to refresh your knowledge of C programming. So the first question many of you might have is, why on earth are we still using C in 2021? Well, C is a language that is very low level compared to other languages you might be used to, but this has advantages because we are doing system level programming. So for compilers, we have to generate machine code. We have to be able to flip bits, to change bits around and so on. And for operating systems, we are in direct contact with hardware. We control hardware, we uh, observe hardware properties. So a language that provides us with an abstraction level that's close to the hardware has many advantages here. So we have a language that provides abstractions of the machine on a high level with C and not just abstractions of arbitrary problems, which is very useful for us because in the end for compilers, as well as for operating systems, you're going to build your own abstractions to make it easier for programmers using your operating system or compiler to actually write their programs to solve their problems on a higher level. Of course, C is not an ideal language by far. There are a number of problems with C and the most significant problems is the support for string processing and data structures, which is quite lacking in C. So compilers uh, really uh, revolve around a lot of string processing when you scan your program source code and also data structures like lists or trees or hash tables to manage your internal state of the program you're compiling. And the operating system also is concerned with internal data structures, data structures that have to be aligned to hardware. These things are not that easy to use or not directly available in plain C, but nevertheless, there are ways to build them and we'll show you some of these in the run of this semester. So things you should be already familiar with when starting this course is to use a plain text editor. So it doesn't really matter which one, if it's uh, just VI or WIM or MX or Nano or some Windows based plain text editor. And you should be able to somehow get the file you edit onto a Unix system. So you can edit your files on a Unix system or if you're not that familiar with Unix, you could also edit them on your Windows system and then copy them over to compile them, which is a bit more tedious to do. So which sort of Unix system should you actually be able to use? So we're going to use Unix systems throughout the semester here. Uh, if you only have Windows systems so far, you could use the Windows subsystem for Windows uh, 10, which is a Linux system that is running as a virtual machine on Windows 10 and it's available as a free download on the Microsoft Store. If you have Mac OS 10, you already have a Unix system, so you're all set and the only thing you might have to do is to install uh, the development tools, so Xcode, and of course you can use a Linux or BSD system. If you don't have any sort of Unix system so far, we will provide a virtual machine that you can run in a software called VirtualBox, which is free, and you can use this Linux system to work on the problems. You could also try to log into some Unix system like we have on campus here, as we see on the next slide. And maybe you should know a bit about program depend uh, dependencies. So uh, we'll teach you how to create, edit and use make files and make. But if you know a bit about this, this can't hurt. All of this is not very difficult. It's really easy to learn, but it may be feel is feeling a bit unfamiliar, especially if you only work with Windows and a graphical IDE like Eclipse for Java before, uh, which also usually provides automatic project management. Here you have to do a number of things by hand, which are done automatically 
by integrated development environments, but this gives you a much tighter and better control over what's actually happening when you compile and run your code. So if you don't have a convenient system handy, as I said, we will provide a virtual machine, or you could also use the system at loginstud.ntnuno. And uh, to do this, you can have a so-called SSH, a secure shell client for Windows. Uh, I would recommend using the PuTTY client, which is free and open source. You can download it. It's a single executable, which is very convenient. And then you can transfer files to these Unix or Linux machines at NTNU using either Samba, you have to be on the VPN or on campus there, to map a network drive or copy them over or edit them directly through the shell through your SSH connection. None of this is really difficult, but it might not be that intuitive to everyone the first time. But getting used to it is a really good way to get more and deeper knowledge into what's going on on the system level and computer system. If there are any problems, just ask around. So don't try to install a 100 megabyte solution somebody recommended on Stack Overflow just to try to get stuff going. We're here to help you. We can't help you with every exotic system configuration, obviously, but for most common stuff, we should be able to find a way. And if you are already pretty much familiar with a Linux or Unix system environment, so if you can find your way around, of course, feel free to use whatever integrated development environment you're used to and you like to use, but don't rely on it being there or don't rely on us knowing all about your specific system. So when we're talking about programming languages, one of the first questions that comes up is which programming paradigms are supported by a given language. Since we're talking about C here, we are mainly concerned with what we call imperative programming. So imperative programming means that a program just consists of a sequence of commands, one after the other. And of course you have things like if conditions and loops. And imperative programming first was a very big mess because you wrote one program and you wrote all of this in one large single piece of program. So soon after programming was invented in the 1940s and 1950s, people got the idea that it would be beneficial to split up your code into several smaller parts, which are easy to manage, easy to specify and easy to write. So this was the birth of procedural programming, which is just a special case of imperative programming. And this means you split up your program into several smaller parts, which are called procedures or functions. And these operate on mostly common data, they might have some local data, and your program then consists of a set of these procedures, which can call each other to actually implement a functionality you want. Uh, of course, what you've seen already is object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming takes a bit of a different approach, whereas data and code and procedural programming are not that closely tied together. Object-oriented programming tries to build a connection between code and data. So data and code operating on that data are encapsulated together in so-called objects. And a program now is a set of objects, and these objects interact via calling conventions we call interfaces. In most common cases, a so-called object-oriented language is based on an imperative programming language and an object-oriented extension. Some of the examples for this are C++, which is obviously based on C. There's another C-based object-oriented language called Objective-C, which you might be familiar with if you've programmed for Mac OS X or uh, iOS, so iPhones before. And uh, well, there are of course different, very different ways to do programming. So you can have functional or declarative programming. So there are languages like Lisp or Haskell or Prolog, which allow you to specify code in a completely different approach. We won't be concerned with these in the semester. As I said, we'll mostly talk about imperative procedural programming using C. So when we talk about programming paradigms, a programming language is not really married to a given paradigm. So a programming language can actually be suitable for different paradigms because a language does not really enforce the use of a paradigm or preclude the use of other paradigms. So you could do a procedural programming in Java. So you could have one large central so-called God object or big hairy object, 
which ties everything together in a big mess. You could do non-procedural imperative programming in C, so you just have one big main function in your C code and that's it. But of course, that's not what you really should be doing. And there are also approaches to do object-oriented programming in C without going to C++, uh, which has worked pretty well for many people, like the GTK libraries on Linux for graphical user interfaces are actually built in a C dialect called C++, which is some sort of object orientation just bolted onto C code. So when we take a look at code, let's start with a comparison here. So we have our typical Hello World program and we have two implementations here, Hello World Java and Hello World C. So in Hello World Java, we see we start with a class, a class given a name called Hello here. And this class includes a number of functions or methods. In this case, only one method here, public static void main. And we see that this public static void main function gets a parameter, which is an array of strings, which is called argv. And this function then implements some functionality that's contained in the inner curly brackets here. And this calls system out print line and then passes it a string, hello world. So obviously this prints hello world to your screen. So what does this look like in C? So in C, it's a bit different. So in C, we start with a bit of a strange statement called hash include, and then in angle brackets, stdio.h. So stdio.h is the so-called standard IO library and the header files, which are the .h files, are files defining the interface to a given library or functionality of another C file. So if you include stdio.h, you tell the compiler you want the declarations of all the functions in stdio.h to be available in your C source code file, hello world.c. And then afterwards, you see we have no class. C does not have classes, so we only have functions here. And our only function is main. Main doesn't get a parameter, so it just has empty brackets. And it returns an integer value, which is common for Unix, so main always should return a value. And this value is returned to the operating system to indicate if a program has been executed successfully or not. If it's zero, it means success. If it's something else than zero, it usually encodes an error code. So here we call a function called printf. So you see, in Java, the print line function was part of system.out. So we have something like namespaces, which contain yeah, different uh, functions and data objects. Here, we only have a function printf. So we don't have any hierarchy of libraries or namespaces available in C. We just call printf and we pass it a string hello world, like in the Java version here. Uh, what's a difference here? So the difference is the compiler doesn't know anything about printf. Printf is just a function like any other function you could write yourself. So there are no reserved system functions. Printf is part of the standard IO library. So actually we have to tell the compiler to use printf by including standard IO.h. And then afterwards we have to combine our compiled code from hello world.c and the library together in a process called linking to create an executable. So if we look at a general structure of C programs, we see, of course, on the top level, we can have functions like our main function we've seen already. Of course, we can have additional functions like our GCD function here. And we see functions can have zero as before or multiple parameters like here. So GCD has parameters A and B, which are both integers, and GCD also returns an integer. What we can also have on the top level are global variables here. So we have a counter variable, which is also an integer declared in the second line of our program text on top. And the main function as in Java is the entrance point for our C program. And as in Java, we can pass the main function parameters from the Unix shell. So whenever we call our program, just typing its name in the shell, we can pass additional parameters. For example, if we want to write an editor, we could pass the editor, the file name to edit on the command line. And these command line parameters are encapsulated in two 
parameters to the main function. The first one is argc, the argument count. So this is an integer variable giving you the number of parameters that were passed on the command line. And the second one is something that looks a bit strange. It's a character asterisk asterisk argv, which essentially is a two-dimensional array uh, of characters or an array of strings. And each of these strings in this array, we'll take a closer look at that in a bit, each of these strings is just one of the parameters you specify on the command line. What you can also see here is that variables can also be local, so you don't have to use, and you should not in general use global variables like our counter variable. So in main, you have a local variable int eastwood, and you can also initialize it directly with the value. And we have another variable car or car character, and we call it lie, uh, which has a value of 240. So can have local variables, you should make use of local variables. These make life quite a bit easier because these are the only parts or some of the only parts where you can have something like automatic memory management in C programs. All the other memory has to be managed by hand from the programmer. So we've already seen we can use printf to output some text to the screen. And here's another example for this. So we have a main function which just declares a variable int eastwood equals 4711. So we have a variable named eastwood, which is an integer and was uh, initialized to the value 4711. And printf has a number of nifty features. So you cannot only pass a simple string to printf, but this string can also contain so-called format placeholders. So these placeholders are always indicated by a percent sign here, percent %d for decimal numbers, and percent %x in green for hexadecimal numbers, for example. And if you include these uh, placeholders in your format string, then you can add the values you want to print afterwards, separated by commas. So your printf has a format string, which specifies that two variables should follow. One is printed as a decimal value, the other is printed as a hexadecimal value. So the first one is minus 815, and the second one, the contents of the variable eastward, which we just initialized to 4711, will be printed as a hexadecimal number automatically. So C does the conversion for you here for free. There are many more placeholders like this. So you can put strings, single characters, and so on. and in general on Unix, if you want to get more information about what's going on there, you can look at the man page. So just when you're logged into a Unix system, you can just type man for manual and then separated by a space, the name of a command or a function like printf. So you can just type man printf and then you get a page indicating parameters, return values, use cases, options, problems with the implementation, all that stuff. Of course, you can also find many of these man pages on the net today. And usually, even though there are several different Unix systems, the basic functionality we're concerned with here in compilers and operating systems is the same for all the systems. There might be some subtle differences, but in general, if you can get code running on one Unix system, it's not that difficult to get it to run on a different one. So we've already seen functions. Functions are with what we could call classless methods. So functions are the elementary building blocks and they enable modularized imperative programs. So for example, if you have a function or a program that does lots of trigonometry, so sines and cosines, it would make really lots of sense whenever you need a sine or a cosine calculated to actually call a sine or cosine function instead of writing the code to calculate your sine and cosine in every location where you need it. So functions reduce the complexity by partitioning complex programs into parts that are much more manageable. And uh, they also hide implementation details because if you've written your sine or cosine function once, and you tested it and you know it works, you don't have to touch it anymore. You can just reuse it over and over again. And that's what makes functions very useful here. What's the difference between a function in an imperative programming language and what's usually called a method in an object-oriented language? Functions are declared and defined in the global scope, so you cannot nest functions inside functions. There is no local functions inside of a function. 
They are not part of a class because we don't have any classes and they do not provide the so-called this operator you might be used to from Java or C++, which is just a handy reference to the current object because we don't have any objects at all. So C is a pretty ancient language. It started off in the early 1970s on machines which are slower than your pocket calculator and your smartwatch today and had less memory, much less memory. So the first Unix machines uh, that had a C compiler ran on something like 256 kilobytes of memory and like 5 megahertz on a 16-bit machine. So Unix evolved quite a bit, but of course the uh, C programmers are concerned with compatibility, so old code should continue to run with minimal changes. So uh, the compiler for C is usually not quite as sophisticated as many of the other compilers you see today. And one thing where you see it is in so-called functions de function declarations. Here you see a piece of code which declares two functions, foo and bar. And we see the implementations of these functions here, which is very simple. But what you see is that there is a re recursive dependency. So foo calls bar in certain circumstances and the other way around bar can also call foo. Now when a compiler starts reading your source code, it starts reading from the start of your the file and then reads until the end of the file. So let's just ignore the first line of the declaration of bar here. So let's just say we had our void foo and our void bar function definitions below. So if I compile foo, foo references bar, but Without the first line, the compiler would not know what parameters bar would take and what values, if any, would bar return. So our compiler would not be able to check if this parameter passed to the execution of bar in foo would actually be the correct type of parameter or the correct number of parameters and so on. The other way around, we are calling foo from inside of bar works pretty well because foo has been defined before. So you can do whatever you want. You can switch foo and bar around, but you won't be able to solve this problem easily. So the way to help out your compiler to really know what's going on is to give it a so-called declaration of a function here. And so that's what the first line does. So it looks like the start of the definition of a function. So it's void for the return type. Void stands for the empty type, so it doesn't return anything then the name of the function bar, and then we specify it's given an int parameter. And this tells our compiler whenever a function call to bar shows up later on, you know, please check that it doesn't return a value, so we don't try to assign the return value of bar to anything because it doesn't have one, and it always takes a single parameter, which is an integer. And then when we define the function, we can also immediately check that the function is defined according to our declaration here. So this makes life easier for the compiler. Forward declarations tell the compiler that bar exists when it compiles foo. Otherwise, the compiler doesn't know anything about it. It will usually only give you a warning, but this warning implies that if you made an error here, if you leave out the first line of declaration here, the compiler can't really check types, and that's a source of many errors in C code, which I've seen already. So it's very good style to actually include declarations here. So let's look at a, a different example here. Uh, let's write a function to swap two variable contents. It's a bit artificial, obviously, uh, but uh, well, it's a very useful example. So in Java, we usually have simple data types, which are called by values. So the value is copied over to the method that is called. And then we have object types, which are called by reference. So when you pass an object to a method, you don't get a copy of the object, but you just get a pointer or a reference to that object, which means a simple data type, when you pass it to a function is copied. An object is just passed over and it's the same memory that is uh, allocated to the object in the calling method. C technically only supports calling by value. So C always copies parameter uh, but you can call by reference by using something called pointers, which we'll see in a bit. So you can try to figure out for the program on the right-hand side, 
what the output of the program is. You see we have in main an integer variable called a, which is given a value of 5. Then we call foo, pass it the, uh, pass it the variable a, and then we print after foo has returned the value of a. And the question, of course, is what happens with a in foo? Well, foo gets a as a parameter and just increments it. So essentially the question is what's happening here and it's important to know that this integer variable in foo is a separate variable so it's copied. So even if it has the same name as a in main it's a different variable at all. So whenever I call foo with some variable a this value of a 5 is copied over into the variable for foo, which is also called a here. Then foo increments it, but it's a local variable. So it's thrown away afterwards. And then when we return to main from our call to foo, a still has the old value of five. So the output of our program would be five. So of course, to build more complex programs, we need things like control structures and luckily those in C are pretty much similar as the ones we have in Java. So we have if conditions with else parts, uh, which are optional as in, uh, as in Java. We have while loops, which have condition upstart. So the condition is checked before entering the loop. We have do loops, which always execute at least once. And then the condition is checked at the end of the loop. We have for loops with the condition inside and also for differentiating between a large number of cases, we have a switch statement. And then inside of loops or of different of these control structures, we can use break to break out of a level of our loop, for example, and we have continue to start from the beginning of a loop. There's one difference. In Java, the conditions are always evaluated to a Boolean variable. C initially didn't have Boolean variables, it just had integers. So the connection condition actually evaluates to an integer which is zero or not equal to zero. So when we work with data, we want to work with standard data types and all of these are also very similar to Java. So we have characters which usually contain values encoded as ASCII characters which are usually 8-bit in size. We have integer numbers which are very often 32 bits in size but this depends on the architecture you're using so these can also have bigger size uh, if you have a 64-bit machine depending on your compiler. You have single and double precision IEEE floating point numbers so 32 and 64 bits and you have a special type void which indicates that you don't expect or don't return a value. And then you can have modifiers for your simple data types. You can have signed values, which means the value is a tooth complement value. Usually in modern computers, you can have unsigned values and you can have so-called short and long values, which means a short integer might be a 16-bit value only and a long integer might be something different. This all depends on your compiler. Uh, we'll show you a bit of a better way to work with this later on. But this is standard C you'll see in all of the textbooks, unfortunately, still. So as we've already seen, the type Boolean for just true and false variables did not originally exist in C, but starting from C99, we have a data type for Boolean variables, which is called bool. So Boolean expressions usually in C evaluate to zero, which means false or one, which means true. And so in C usually, and you see this in most of the code, integers are used in place of Boolean variables. So you can do something like in the code below. So you can have print, uh, that should be print F probably, uh, percent D, and then you can have a comparison uh, expression here. So 4711 is larger than 42, and this is obviously true. True means one. So if we print this, it doesn't print true, it prints one. And on the other way around, if you write a loop, which should be an endless loop, you cannot write while true but you just write y1 because 1 means true and you built an endless loop. Now, just having simple scalar variables is not that much fun when you want to write more complex programs. We know that there are no classes in C, but there's a bit more of a primitive construct in C, which is called a complex data type or just struct or structure. 
So we could look at structs as being classes without methods. So it's just a collection of data objects, but it doesn't indicate any functions operating on these. So in the right hand code, we have a structure called student, and this has uh, three elements, two integer variables, which indicate a student ID and the age of the student and an array of characters giving the name of the student. And then we have a function called rejuvenate, which is used to set the age of the student back to zero here. This is past a structure uh, for a student. And then we have a function foo, which declares a variable of type struct student, sets the student's age to 20, and then calls rejuvenate to set the age back to zero. Now the question is, what happens here? So the first question, you might, be one, uh, we might want to think about why does this instruction not cause an exception? Why can you just declare a struct student as one here when you have a struct student on top? And the other question obviously is uh, what's the age of as one after you return from your rejuvenate calls? What's important to know is that in contrast to Java, structure parameters, so if you pass a structure like our struct student as one here, if you pass this to a function, these are also passed by value, so they are copied over. So we have a similar problem like in previous code, so maybe that's one interesting thing to think about here. So when we want to work on data, we need operators for numerical calculations, logical operations, and so on. These are mostly identical in C or Java. So uh, you have some special stuff like the plus plus and minus minus operators, which mean pre-decrement and post-increment. So you don't always have to write A equals A plus one, but you can write A plus plus. This is just a shorthand. You don't need to use it, but you see it very often. The round brackets indicate a method or function call as in Java, and we have a single minus, of course, which is just a unary negation. And then we have all sorts of arithmetic operators, also plus, minus, multiplication, division, the percent sign is modulo, and then we have uh, shift operators, we have Boolean comparison operators, so less than, less or equal, equals, not equals, and so on and so forth. There are a number of differences. So we have operators which do a so-called typecast, which is indicated on the left-hand side here with the brackets T and the dot operator. These are also in Java, but with different semantics. And we have some special operators which are only available in C, like the arrow operator, which is a dereferencing operator for a pointer, and then the asterisk and ampersand operator, which are also part of pointer processing, as we'll see in a bit. And we have a operator called size of, which returns the size in bytes of the data object that you indicate. That's very useful when you need to manually allocate memory. So when we're talking about operators, there are a number of things we should be concerned about. So the first thing is how to access members of an object. Well, in Java, you have uh, methods and member variables of an object which are declared inside of your class, so you can automatically get access to this. C does not provide objects with related methods. And all, another interesting thing is in C, you can do a so-called typecast. So if you have a variable of a given type, you can actually tell the compiler, please reinterpret this value as to be of a different type. Now in Java, this is automatically checked for validity. So essentially in Java, you cannot do arbitrary typecasts. In C, it's a bit different. In C, if you do a typecast to a different type, the value in memory just gets interpreted as the new type, no matter if this makes sense or not. So if you look at this piece of code here, this declares an integer variable called Eastwood, given the value of hexadecimal. This is indicated by OX, and then the hexadecimal value D431. And then we have a character variable, ly, and now we cast our variable eastward, which is an integer, to a character. Now this is problematic because the integer variable usually has four bytes. So we initialize this with a value here that uh, is bigger than one byte, but the variable we're assigning this to 
ly, our character variable, only has eight bits, so one byte in size. So we're losing data. So our variable ly just contains the value 49 after doing this assignment. And the question is why? And this is an interesting question to think about. We have a number of additional operators. So if we have a variable here, this variable lives somewhere in memory. And if we need to access the address of this variable, we use the address operator, which is the ampersand character, which means if you give it the name of the variable, which is somewhere in memory, uh, you are returned the address of this variable then using the address operator. And the other operators, the uh, dereference operator and the size of operators are actually discussed later on. Now when talking about variables, it's important to always initialize variables, the same as in Java. If we don't do it, our variables have undefined values, which means if we're lucky, they can have something like zero as a value, but this is not guaranteed. We've already seen that we can combine our variable declaration with initialization. So we could say something like int counter equals zero. So we don't only have memory space reserved for an integer variable called counter, but we also ensure that at the start of our program, this variable is initialized to the value zero. And these values can have global or local scope as we've also already seen. So global variables are declared on the same level as functions in our C code, whereas local variables are declared inside of functions, but the declaration style looks exactly the same. And what's also important is that parameters in a function definition here, like GCD, which has two parameters A and B, these are also just local variables. So you don't have to declare them explicitly. They're implicitly designed by including them in your function declaration here. So first you can have global variables, which are, as we've seen, defined outside, defined outside of functions like our counter variable. These are accessible in the program from the point of the line where they are defined. And if we have variables with names that are identical as a local variable, like if you had another counter variable as a local variable in a function, these would overlay the declaration of our global variable. So we have a name conflict here, but our compiler doesn't complain about an error, but it just silently replaces whatever references to a global variable would be in a function to references to a local variable of the same name. This is dangerous and can cause lots of problems. So global variables miss context. We don't really know with the global variable which functions operate on this, which functions manipulate this value. So it's missing context. We don't have any relation between data objects and the code using these functions. Functions can change variables at any time without the functions call or noticing it uh, or accept, accepting it. So there are side effects here. And this makes program maintenance much more difficult. So one good tip is here to avoid global variables in C code whenever possible. Sometimes it's not really possible, but as a general rule of thumb, try to get rid of them. So usually we want to use local variables here, which are declared inside and at the start of a function, or you can also have blocks, which are also included in curly brackets, as you see in the code on the right here, which can also include, again, local variables here. These are only accessible inside of the function or block where they are declared. So in main, we have an integer variable a declared inside of the block here. And this variable a is only visible inside of the inner curly brackets here. So outside of it, you would have to uh, use the global value, uh, value of a, which is declared on the top and inside of the curly brackets inside of main, then it's the special local int variable, which has the same name. Yes, this is confusing, but that's the way C code is. So if we have something declared locally, it overlays all previous outside definitions of uh, something, a variable with the same name, and these are not accessible inside of the block. So we don't have any methods to do namespacing and so on, as we've seen. So we only have to live with this. So of course, the question is which value is returned by main? in the example we give on the right hand side. And that's also an exercise for you to work on. So what do we know so far? We've seen a number of things that are not available in C, classes, 
exceptions. We haven't talked about these, but we don't have any exceptions in C. So when something goes wrong in the C program, very often you see it crashes, unfortunately. We don't have any qualifiers to indicate the scope of data, like public, private, or protected. We don't have garbage collection. We don't have new. So if we want to allocate memory dynamically on the heap, we have to do it by hand. We don't have import statements. We only have the include, which was much more primitive. And in the beginning, you also didn't have single line comments using the slash slash operator. These are valid from C99 on, and you're really welcome to use them because they make typing much more easier. Stuff available in C so far are functions, global and local variables, and include to include header file definitions of functions. So in C, you have a number of so-called keywords. These keywords are reserved. So they're used, for example, for declaring data types like ints and longs. There are control structures like for or if and else and so on. So these are reserved. So in C, if you try to name a variable, for example, return, this would confuse the compiler because it accepts return to be a keyword. So you would get an error. So these C keywords actually cannot be used for function or variable names. Now, if we compile our program, this program has to be loaded into memory and there are specific conventions how this memory looks like. And as we've seen, we have different types of data here. So we have global variables, even if you should not use them, of course, we have to provide for them. Global variables have their own segment, which is the so-called data segment. And there's another segment called the BSS for historical reasons, so-called base storage segments or block storage segments. So these contain global variables. The difference is that the data segment contains initialized data. So whenever you say int counter equals 42 as a global variable, this ends up in the data segment. Whereas if you have uninitialized data, so just int foo, this ends up in BSS. Now for local variables, you have to find a different approach to do it. Though, so local variables are stored on the stack. This stack is handled automatically by the code generated by your compiler. So whenever you enter a function that uses local variables, then a new so-called stack frame is created on the stack. So it's just put on top of the existing stack frames and it's automatically removed when you return from the function. And then you have the so-called heap which contains dynamic variables. In Java, you would create them using the new keyword. In C, we'll take a closer look at what happens later using pointers and the so-called malloc memory allocation function. Now, as you see on the right-hand side, the uh, layout of your program in the address space of your computer is very much fixed. So it starts at the lowest addresses that are available with your program code. So the binary representation of the machine instructions that your compiler generated. After the program code, the initialized data, so your data segment comes in memory. And after that, your block storage segment for your uninitialized data comes. So what's interesting is what happens on the top of our picture here. So we have a heap, so heap, starts, heap storage starts after the block storage segment and it grows upwards. So whenever we allocate more and more elements on the heap, uh, the, our pointer to the top of the heap goes upwards. So we use more heap space here. And the stack now is allocated in the different order. So we start from the top of memory, from our highest addresses, and wherever we call an additional function, we add a function level, so a stack frame to the stack below. And this is a very interesting, simple approach to actually avoid allocating fixed numbers of memory for heap and stack. So what happens is when stack and heap sizes grow, they grow towards each other. Of course, you need to take care that heap and stack don't overrun. So overwrite each other, this would be an error condition. In most systems nowadays, your operating system actually takes care of the fact that stack and heap should not collide. And if this happens, well, you have a different problem here. So if we take a closer look at the memory layout, 
uh, we have a nice tool here on the right hand side. So we compile a piece of code using the GCC compiler and this co uh, compiles a source code file mem.c and gives it an output name of mem.elf. Elf just stands for the typical Unix executable format, executable and linkable format. And then you have a tool called nm. nm is typical Unix fashion, so people are lazy, they don't want to type that much. So nm stands for names. So it gives the names of the symbols for variables and functions contained in the program we just compiled. And the program we compiled is shown on the left hand side. And there we see four different symbols highlighted. So we have global uninitialized, as we've seen, this is a global variable, and this is uninitialized, so this ends up in the BSS segment. So as we've seen on the right hand side, we have global uninitialized, we have an address on the left, and in the middle between the address and the name is a B, and B stands for BSS segment. So this indicates that this global uninitialized variable ends up in BSS. Then we have global initialized, which is initialized to a given value here. So if we look at that one, this has obviously a different address and this has a capital D for data segment. And then we have a function called uBoot. uBoot is down there, it has a certain address and it has a capital T for text segment and another function main, which has a different address obviously and is also in the text uh, segment. So one interesting question here is, why is the variable local not shown in the list on the right? So this is a local variable and you should think about why this is actually not included in the list of names on the right hand side. What you can also do is you can take a look at the addresses of variables and even functions at runtime. So if you want to figure out where your compiler or operating system puts certain values, you can just use the ampersand, the address operator we've seen before. So in this example code, we see that we have a special formatting string, which is called percent %p. Percent %p indicates it's a pointer. So it's the address of a variable, which is usually printed as a hexadecimal number. So here we take the addresses of our four variables or functions we've seen in the previous slide. So global uninitialized, global initialized, uBoot and uh, local in this case and which is interesting here is uh, well we get the addresses for global uninitialized global initialized and uBoot as we've seen before so the right hand side here with our nm output is identical obviously to what our program outputs at runtime uh, and you would also get the identical address for main if you outputted this but for our local variable we get a very different address here. So we got uh, 0xffe62a80, which is a far bigger number than all the addresses of the other variables and the functions we've seen before. And this is exactly because local is a variable that's on the stack. We've seen local variables are included in stack frames. The stack starts from the very top of our address space. So the very top has the highest address values. So that's why our variable local actually has the highest value here. And we see it's a completely different range of memory. It's far away from all the other objects here in our program.